Kirsten works as a nutritional coach in Vienna. She built one of the biggest German paleo and low carb blogs. She writes books and has recently started a podcast show, The Evolution Radio Show. And she's also a self confessed science geek. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. And I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to talk about the most common health markers and what I'm hoping to do is giving you some tools to interpret and understand those markers. But maybe some of you may think, why should I care and isn't that my doctor's job? And yes it is, but most doctors don't have the time or they don't care. And I apologize to all the physicians in the room. <laughs> uh, there are they are the exception to the rule. Uh, most doctors really don't have the time. And in Austria, a uh, family practitioner has on average five minutes per patient. That's not a lot of time. And it's, in, it's definitely not enough time to, to talk you through your lab test. It's just enough time to write a prescription. But we, before we look into the individual markers, I want to stress one thing. Um, there are a lot of factors that influence your results. So if you want the most reliable results of your lab test, um, you have to standardize. And there are, so just there are a few things that influence your lab results, like stress, sleep duration, training, food intake, of course. And that's why you need to standardize. So standardization is really key to reliable results. What do I mean by that? You shouldn't train two days prior to your blood draw. You should fast at least 12 hours, that's very important. You shouldn't drink nothing but water. Um, if you have repeated blood draws, it's, very, it's kind of important that they are around the same time, if you can manage. And I don't know about you, but the weekends are always different. So you, you shouldn't have your, your lab test done on a Monday. So keep that in mind. The first set of markers we are looking into our heart health. And the most common one or the most prominent one is the lipid panel. And we have heard about that a couple of times during the, this um, con conference. And it usually consists of those four markers. It's total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. And to make the whole thing a little less confusing, I wanted to present some real numbers of a client of mine. And he is a male, uh, 37 years old, healthy, slim, very active, he's a non-smoker and eating low carb, high fat. And the first thing his doctor saw, pointed out, was the elevated total cholesterol. So there's a problem with total cholesterol and we already heard about that. Total cholesterol is not, a, not really a risk factor. In fact, even the um, famous Framingham study, it's, it's one of the biggest health studies ever, ever done. Uh, they, they concluded that there is no correlation between elevated total cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. And even 50% of all the people who had a heart attack had really good cholesterol numbers. So, the next factor or the next uh, marker his doctor looked at was a, a LDL cholesterol, and Eva, and that was also elevated. But there's a problem with LDL cholesterol. It's not measured; it's calculated, and they, all the labs use a formula from 1972, so-called Friedewald formula. And the problem with this formula is that the, if you have low triglyceride, triglycerides, it's it overrates your LDL. And most people eating a low-carb, paleo-like diet are going to have low triglycerides. So your LDL will come out or will, will show up higher than it really is. There are alternative formulas, one from 2008 and one from 2013. And if we do the math for our patient zero, we see uh, the numbers would look quite different. And with the latest formula, if you use the latest formula, they would be even in the, in the normal range. So that, that keep in mind. 
a good risk factor would be your ratio triglycerides to HDL. And there are upper, lim upper limits for men and women. And when we calculate the ratio for our patient zero, we see that he has no risk whatsoever. So his ratio is really, really good. There are times when size matters, and especially when it comes to LDL particle size. Not all LDL particles are created equal. We have uh, big fluffy ones, and we have small dense particles. And as far as we know today, it's the small dense that's, that's causing the problem. And so you don't want a lot of those floating around. But the problem is, th the particle number is rarely measured. But here comes the good news. Your triglycerides will tell you what size your LDL particles are. There is a strong correlation between, between um, tri tri well, sorry, tri tri triglycerides levels and LDL particle size. And I quickly go uh, explain the graph. We see triglycerides here and LDL, total LDL cholesterol. These are the small dense particles. These are the um, big fluffy ones. And <coughs> with very low triglycerides, you will have all of, almost all of your um, LDL particles are going to be big fluffy ones. So that's a very, very good marker to look at. So just to sum that up, what we've learned so far, total cholesterol is not associated with, associated with cardiovascular disease. LDL is wrongly calculated. LDL particle size is uh, much more important. And what is a risk is low, H, low HDL and high triglycerides. And you can um, calculate the ratio triglycerides to HDL. As, and that's a very good surrogate marker. The next uh, risk factor I want to look at is uh, weight or body weight. And there, there are a lot of uh, health decisions made based on your body weight. And, you, and the method practitioners usually use to kind of assess your risk uh, based on your body weight is uh, the BMI, so the body mass index. But the body mass index is a kind of an, an antiquated and unreliable tool because it doesn't take body composition into account. So people with a lot of body mass look, look worse. So um, I myself have a body weight, uh, have a BMI of 23. And uh, for women, a BMI of 24 is considered overweight. So I'm close, <laughs> as you can see. And that, this would be a problem. That's why the BMI is not a, not a good way to assess your risk. A better way would be the waist to height ratio. All you need is to measure your waist and your height, and then you get the ratio. And I don't know who remembers the film, Arnold, uh, Twins with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito is from the 80s. Um, the, the reason I've chosen this picture is not because of Arnold Schwarzenegger, so he's Austrian and I'm too, so no. <laughs> Uh, it's because I think it shows very clearly the advantages of the waist-to-height ratio. Since when we look at the BMI, they really would appear like twins. So they would be considered overweight. When we calculate the waist-to-height ratio, that shows a much clearer picture and that's why it's, it's much, much better. But in the end, it's not about your weight. It's about how much body fat you have. And too much, or having too much body fat is a bad thing. So how could you measure your body fat? One method is skin fold measurement. It's very easy, quite reliable. Uh, the downside is it takes a little bit of time and practice. And you need, most of the time, you need someone, someone else to do it. So that's, that's the problem with this method. Another one would be bioelectrical impedance analysis. It's, it's the scales that measure your, uh, with, the, with the current. And it's cheap, it's easy to use, you can do it alone, and it's available at home. 
the downside is that, that it's affected by hydration. So especially for women, we tend to accumulate water weight during the period, so this could um, influence your, your results. One of the best ways is the DEXA scan, and, and that's a picture of me, by the way. <laughs> and the DEXA scan is usually used to measure bone density, but you can use, to, can use it to determine your body composition. It's considered a gold standard, but it's very expensive. So what's to remember? Waste to height ratio and skin fold measurement is better than weight alone. The next set of markers we are looking at are all about your metabolic health. And usually most practitioners just use or just look at fasting blood sugar. And fasting blood sugar is not enough. Why? Blood sugar is easily, easily influenced by a lot of factors like sleep deprivation. Um, if you are having stress, that will influence your, your fasting or your blood sugar. Infection and illness also can significantly influence your blood sugar. It, and training, of course. In response to training, your blood sugar will go up. So that's why fasting blood sugar alone is not a really good marker. A better way would be to look at fasting insulin. Fasting insulin is a better indicator for your metabolic health. Um, because fasting insulin changes way before your fasting blood sugar will show signs of dysregulation. The problem is there's not much agreement on ideal fasting uh, insulin levels, but we can use fasting insulin to calculate our insulin sensitivity, and we do that by using HOMA, homeostasis model assessment of insulin resistance. Really long word. <laughs> but it's quite easy. All you need is your fasting insulin and fasting blood sugar, and then you will get a score, and based on that score, you can determine how insulin sensitive or how insulin resistant you, you are. Uh, so basically, the higher your HOMO score is, the more insulin resistant you are, and the better would probably be a carbohydrate restricted diet, and it can even be an early warning sign for type two diabetes. Long-term blood sugar control is another very important marker when we look at metabolic health. And again, fasting blood sugar tells you nothing about your long-term blood sugar control. To do that, we need to look at HbA1c. It's hemoglobin A1c, and it's an indicator for how good your blood sugar control is over a long t period of time. Um, it's usually used to, to, um, to control your diabetes or diabetes management. Uh, it's uh, when you when, when you're have high levels of, of glucose in your bloodstream, it tends to bind to the hemoglobin in the red blood cells and then forms HbA1c. So even it's used for diabetes control, even non-diabetics can really profit by having a look at, the, at HbA1c. And the last test or, or mark I want to talk about is uh, OGTT and, how you, and why you are at risk of failing the test when you're eating a low-carb diet. OGTT, it's uh, short for oral glucose tolerance test and it's a glucose challenge test. So it goes basically like this. You have to drink a sweet sugar mixture with a lot of glucose in it, and then they will measure your blood sugar two hours later. And so why would you do such a thing? And in, in continental Europe, this test is mandatory for pregnant, pregnant women to determine the risk of uh, developing gestational diabetes. So that's per se not a bad thing. But when you're eating a low-carb diet, this could be a problem because you're at risk, you're at risk of failing the test. Um, that's why people eating a low-carb diet develop something called physiological insulin resistance. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's not, 
not like the kind of insulin resistance you would see in type 2 diabetes or the metabolic syndrome. It's, it's a normal physiological reaction and it's reversible. But without the right preparation, so you're going to fail the test. And then you would have to argue with your doctor and maybe he's putting you on diabetes medication. So how could you prepare? Just, eating, just start eating carbs three days prior to the test. And uh, most people don't have to go uh, binge on carbs. For me personally, a few potatoes and some rice just did the trick. Um, and then you're good to go. And there's no, uh, no risk of failing the test. Now, it has been a great conference. It's, it's uh, the second day. It's, Sunday afternoon and maybe, and I covered a lot, so maybe I've lost some of you somewhere in the middle and that's why um, here are the three things you should remember. A lot of factors can influence your test results, so therefore standardize as much as possible. Triglycerides to HDL ratio is a good surrogate marker for your heart health and BMI is not a good way to assess your risk. Instead, use body fat percentage and or waist to height ratio. Thank you. Uh, um, just in case, um, I, I will put up the slides on the, on, in the internet, and that's the link. So it's paleolowcarb.com slash hu2015. Up on, the, on that uh, chart that you showed us about uh, yeah. uh, the triglycerides and the, and, the, and the large uh, fluffy. Should we, should I skip? Yeah, like, like the, uh, the relation between yeah. the two. Yeah, you want to have a look? If, if you can expand a little bit more on that, maybe. I don't know if I... So, so that you, if you have a, so the, bet, the lower the, the yeah. triglycerides you have, the, the, the more of the... the the more of the of your track of your um, the, the more of the big fluffy uh, particles you're going to have, so that's kind of a, so instead of measuring it, you could look at the ratio and and then draw your and is there, conclusions. Is there like a ratio or, or some like a, that where you can put the numbers in and calculate it. Um, like it's actually from 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 a study the the graph I showed you. Um, I one one thing to keep in mind. I think what we see is that below 100, so triglyceride levels of 100, we we kind of see a positive relation, or or that's you will have a, a, mostly mostly all of your HDM LDL particles will be fl big fluffy ones. Hi, thank you. Um, when you talk about telling your clients that you know you should be two days after yeah. the end, I mean, um, a lot of people, and I, I put myself in there, uh, you know, you, you drink alcohol more more than you should. Yeah. So what, what do you tell What do you tell them about that? On weekends? You no. Know, when you When you're going to take, uh, let's say, a blood test, yeah. Or you're going to look you look at your um, insulin levels, Wait, your stress levels. And you, you know, know it. Be yeah. honest and do it, you know, after you had your genuine, you know, two glasses of wine every night or whatever it is. Not if you're doing that on a regular basis, I thought I think it, it just shows, um, I think it would be, maybe it would be cheating or something like when you're doing, when you stop doing it, but um, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do your blood test after a weekend of, of binge drinking, of course. Uh, so. Yeah, that's the kind, we see that there's a kind of a, you know, turning point and it's right below 100. So to keep that in mind, staying under, under 100 uh, milligram per deciliter of your triglycerides would be a good thing to, to aim at. 
any dietary intervention that you can suggest for like the triglycerides to stay low? Low, low carb, carb low carb, since it shows in the triglycerides if you're not eating low carb. So it would, it would be a good way to control <laughs> so your, your uh, clients when they are saying they are eating low carb, is it actually low carb enough for them, so to speak. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.